the, the key to that work ethic is doing the things you don't want to do. Um, the dirty jobs that need to be done. And it also sends a powerful message of leadership to your, your help as well if you're willing to do that. But you can't run away from the things you don't want to do and that work ethic will drive you to do those things. Alright everybody, welcome here. Another episode of our vlog series, uh, Meeting with Business People. We've got today Mike Hope from the famous Rocking R Bar here in Bozeman, Montana. Mike was kind enough to let a grizzly come into his bar <laughs> and uh, get to interview him here today. Mike, thanks for coming today. You bet. Go Cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm so excited to get to do this, Mike. You, you have no idea what this means to me. This great. is just, just great to sit down with Montana businesses. That's what we're here about, is seeing how we can give back to other businesses to show them that it doesn't matter where you're at in Montana or in the country, you can do it. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, uh, and your family and your business and kind of what makes you tick? Well, I got into the hospitality business when I was 14. I lied about my age and got a dishwashing job. And uh, my dad was irritated at me. He said, you're too young to be working. And after about two weeks of doing dishes, I came home and I said, dad, you're right. I shouldn't be working. I'm gonna quit. And he said, oh no, you're not quitting. I'll let you know when you can quit. Well. About uh, 40 plus years later, I'm still in the business and doing it, and that's where I got the passion for the hospitality industry. I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I came to college here in the uh, early 80s, and I went to work for one of my mentors, Ralph Ferraro, who owned the R Bar then. And uh, over a period of time, we just developed a partnership after I got out of college, and we've done three or four projects together. So, you mentioned Ralph, great guy. How did you guys maintain that relationship over so many years and not end up exploding like so many businesses do? You know, I think the key to us, our success um, from day one, we never argued over money. Uh, greed never got in the way. We've had our disagreements, trust me, but we never, uh, money didn't get in the way. He didn't drive a nicer car than I did. Or have, we didn't worry about things like that. So money was never an issue between us. And trust me, times were very tight over the years. Still continue to be that way. But uh, we just had a vision on moving the business forward together. And at times, his relationship has been easier than my marriage. <laughs> Don't tell my wife that though. <laughs> so you're clearly a very driven person. You work. A, an unbelievable number of hours over the years. What is it that you think, was it developed as a child? Is it just innate in you? What is it that gives you that drive? Yeah, my, my, my mom and dad uh, uh, never gave us anything. We always, part of a deal, if you wanted something, if you paid for half of it, you could buy it. They'd pay for the other half. Uh, so at an early age, whatever we wanted, we had to earn and I'm very thankful to my family for the work ethic that they gave me and that's really what's important in the business world is a work ethic. And what are some little key tidbits you could give to people about work ethic? How do they go about developing that kind of work ethic? You know I think that when you get into business for yourself you think gosh I'm my own boss I'm in charge. Well the reality is the, the key to that work ethic is doing the things you don't want to do. Um, the dirty jobs that need to be done. And it also sends a powerful message of leadership to your, your help as well if you're willing to do that. But you can't run away from the things you don't want to do and that work ethic will drive you to do those things. Excellent. And I see that so often that business owners will say, oh that's below me, right? But I, I think you raised such a great point there that you can't do that. When you own the business, you're the one who's got to make sure everything gets done. And if something slips, it's on you. It's that's, accountability, right? Yeah, that's accountability. And it's just a function of ability to pay yourself. You know, when you first start out in this business, you, you might not be able to afford the plumber to come in and unplug the sink or replace the toilet or whatever. You do things by necessity to get you to the end goal. So. When you were young, were there certain things that you can remember in life that were like key little takeaways that you had that really helped you in business? I think where I've been really fortunate, you know, I started my career out, uh, out of college with Miller Brewing Company, but I've always had mentors in my life. 
Um, when I met, like Ralph as an example, I graduated from college and it was 10 years after I left school that I came back to town, but we always stayed in contact with each other. And you always want to talk to successful people. And, and when I say successful people, successful people have failures in their life too. And that's when you can learn the most is how people handle it when that valley is. How do you get back on top? And the more you can nurture those relationships, uh, never take them for granted. And you have to really work at that. You gotta reach out and continue to reach out because people just aren't gonna reach out to you. I love that right there. Uh, one of my mentors has a saying that is proximity is power, right? Getting close to people who've already gotten there because you can learn from them, as you said, learn from their mistakes or their failures yep. so that you see those and you know how to avoid them. Yep. Now, you you also, in talking about failures, I believe that you're also a strong believer that failing is a necessity, right? The feel of failure should drive you, but it shouldn't stop you. If you don't fail, you don't succeed. And if you ask anybody that's done anything in business for themselves, they can all talk about failures that they, they had when they were going through it. It's just how you handle it and how you work your way out of it. Because life isn't a straight up trajectory. You're, things are gonna happen that you don't expect to happen and you just gotta, you gotta work through them. Give me an example of that, because I, I love that thought that there are plateaus we hit, right? Like right. athletes yeah. in business, we hit plateaus, which means we're not seeing something that's preventing us from growing to the next level. What's an example in your, your world that you've had? Well, <laughs> in 2009, when the economy, I, I really thought in Montana and Bozeman in particular, we were gonna get through this recession. Mid 2008, we were trending up in all of our businesses about 20% and going, and I was talking to people around the country and they're telling me how bad it was. Um, well, in about July of 2008, all of a sudden our, our three operations were down 16, 17%. And it just escalated all the way through and really caught us off guard. And then put on top of it, we had a natural gas explosion and blew up one of our more successful operations, which was the Rock and R. Um, that adversity, when you were telling me that I was going through it and trying to struggle to, to stay afloat, uh, if you were telling me that I was gonna be better off today as a result of it, I, I wouldn't have believed you. But working through it um, as an individual and as a family and as a business, we got through it and we got back on top again. Um, but that was that perseverance, and we had a lot of people that helped us. There, there was a lot of uh, mentors, a lot of people that I knew. The community was unbelievably strong and supporting what we were trying to get done in downtown Bozeman. So that's when you really understand the power of community, because we wouldn't have got rebuilt without the power of our community of Bozeman. How did Bozeman reach out to you and help you with that? Yeah, yeah there were simple things that um, we had help that um, we couldn't afford to pay anymore, and they were some of them were college students. Our, our cleaners, they this was one of their sole incomes. Uh, they created a fund that people that got impacted by the explosion were able to apply to to get money to help keep supporting them until they could get a job again. And that's just the community. Somebody, in the, I don't even remember who did it, but somebody said, let's start a fund through our downtown organization, they'll manage it, and we'll help support those people. Well, that was a relief for me personally, because you're not only worried about yourself, you're worried about the people that work for you as well, too. So that's just one small way the community came forward. Now, I know you are a big supporter of the MSU Bobcats, mm -hmm. and you're a big supporter of community events. Tell me about that. What, what drives you to be that involved in the community? Yeah, I, I think um, your business is only as good as the community that you live in. The community affords me to li uh, make a living to support my family. So in return, I need to get back and support the community and help the people that can't help themselves. With the Bobcats, I'm a Montana State graduate. Um, when I talk about the mentors and the connections, people from all over the country that I met when I came to college here in the early 80s, I still stay in touch with them today. They were people that called me when the bar blew up um, in, in support. So it's not just about that education, it's that network of people. So that sense of community pride with Montana State and supporting the community are a real a natural tie together for us. And 
we, we are firm believers and we are only as good as our community is. When I talk to businesses, oftentimes they talk about their X factor or what's unique about them in their business. What would you say is one of the X factors in the way that you and, and Ralph or just you have run your businesses? You know, I think the biggest X factor is our personality. You can love or hate us, but we're here every day. And another X factor is this bar has been around since 1947. Ralph bought it in 1978. And there's been a constant support for MSU and the Bobcats and a belief in that community. Um, and that's an X factor. And over time, it even multiplies. Now, now we have people coming back that um, their kids are, that I went to school with, their kids are coming to school here. And now we're even starting to get some of the grandkids coming to school here. So that's a, you don't do that overnight. And business and wealth isn't created overnight. It's created over a long haul. Um, you have your ups and downs, but you keep trying to move the right direction and do the right things. I think that's a big X factor for us personally. Excellent. So, so many business owners talk about their team. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you do to help build your team culture here? Because I know you're the the bartenders, the servers, everybody's top notch here. They they clearly love what they do. What is it that that you bring to the table for them in that team world? Well, part of that is we hold them accountable and we have expectations. Um, our, our goal is to be the best bar in America and we're still striving to get there, but that's an expectation. We hold people accountable for those expectations. So when, when you're winning and you're tied into the community, it gives them a sense of being tied in. What's really neat is when somebody works here, they graduate and they go into their career and they come back 10 years after working for you and go, you know what, I get it. I really understand what that sense of community was about. And here's the things I, I did work in here. So I think really high expectations is the key to the success of what we do with our staff. And, and what we tell them is we could put multi-million dollars into facilities, but you know what? If we got staff in there that doesn't care, it doesn't matter. People are the difference makers in any industry. I don't care what industry it is. So with that, how do you encourage your team to grow personally and in the job? Yeah. Well, one, one thing that we do talk about that might be unique, when we hire young college kids, we don't hire anybody unless they're 21, but when we hire them at 21, our expectation is that they're going to get their degree and they're going to go into their career. They're not going to be a lifer here. This is a means to get them to where they need to go. Um, we really try to strive that and, and we really try to support. We've helped kids with books costs over the year. We've helped kids with tuitions over the years. Um, and they give back to us uh, as well too for w what they do. Um, we're not easy to work for, but we're fair. And again, if you get people to reach their human potential, when they came to college here, they didn't come to be a bartender their whole life. They came here Maybe they want to be a teacher. Maybe they want to be an engineer. Maybe they want to be a lawyer. We want to push them. We've got an assistant manager here now that is getting ready to start nursing school. And she got turned down the first time, but she didn't give up. She went back, took some classes over, and we encourage her to do that. Um, it would be better for me if she stayed because she's such a great employee, but the reality is that's not what her goal in life was. We want to help them get to their goals in life. That's fantastic. Uh, you find that the personal growth of your employees also feeds back into the business, don't big you? Big time, big time. So when people are, have goals for themselves and high expectations for themselves, they're a natural. People are just gravitate towards people that think that way. And that's, we're in a very social environment. People want to be around winners. Yeah. <laughs> so technology, I've watched it change. And I've only been in this industry for probably 15 years. So about half as long as you have been, not to date you. But what, what have you seen? How has technology really changed the, the hospitality industry here? I think how we manage our business day to day. Um, how we can track our inventory, how we track our sales, how we track the accountability of our employees and what they're selling. 
um, and, and we can serve service our guests or our customer much faster today because of technologies. We just went to handheld, so when they're standing at the table, they're punching the order in. By the time they get back to the bar, the foods to the kitchen and the drink orders to the bartender, that gives us about a three minute head start on what we're doing and, and controlling our costs. If you don't use technology in this industry today, you're gonna go broke. So now you're seeing your numbers faster than ever. I presume you can probably more or less calculate your profitability on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, and, and we track our sales by, by, by the hour. We kind of have three businesses. We have a lunch business, we have a happy hour business, and we have a late night college business. And they're three distinct different segments. And we track which segments up or down, so we track every hour of the day. And then we know what our mix is right away as sales. We weigh all of our alcohol, so we, we can do inventory control. The margins are good, but that margin can go out the window quicker than anything. And again, that lies into expectations. If the help knows you're watching your business and paying attention to it, guess what? They're more likely to watch it and pay attention and care about it. Excellent. So. What is uh, some additional ways that you've utilized technology beyond inventory control? So we have a pretty uh, computer intensive uh, light show, laser show, that ties in with the dance floor at night. Um, I'd like to say we have the best one in Bozeman, maybe the best one in the state for a bar atmosphere, but it's all tied through the computer system. Uh, we, we use uh, Snapchat and Instagram, so we have instant technology to tie into the telephones. Um, that's the way the younger generation communicates to themselves, and they want to see it. If they see that you're, when I was a kid, people just have to come to the bar to see if it was busy. Well, we can put it out there, this, and they can see it's the place to be. And that, that's technology that, as I've gotten older, maybe scares me, but we have to embrace it and have to be willing to let somebody that knows how to use it, use it to our advantage. Well, and it's free, right? That's one of the great things. It's unbelievable. So now you're reaching out to hundreds, if not thousands of customers in a given evening saying, hey, look, place is packed, you better get here. 15 years ago, our mode of advertising was print medium, radio, and a little TV. And that was probably about 98% of our advertising budget. Today, that, those three mediums are probably 1% of what we do, and the rest of it is all done through social media. So if we didn't adapt and didn't change to that, we would lose contact with our, but you can't just depend on social media. We do things that are unique. We hire what we call brand ambassadors to still have that human intelligence that are up top, but they tie the social media in uh, with the younger generation for us. Tell us more about that. What's a brand ambassador? Yeah. So they work for us and their job is to connect um, with the students up on that campus. Um, and by, by that, we do some unique things. We, we do treasure hunts. Uh, we create pencils with the R bar. We've got uh, notepads with R bar logos on them. We've got keychains, and they create the items. We created a, a card holder for the back of the, um, the, the, the cell phone. It's about getting our brand imaging out there. I'm 55 years old. A college kid doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> so, and then they become part of it. They bring them in. And I enjoy talk. What I love about talking to the college kids is they keep me fresh. So, you're always evolving on how, if we did it how we did it yesterday, we're not going to get what we could get tomorrow. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, you mentioned Snap, you mentioned uh, Instagram. Are you trying any new social media mediums right now or, or investigating any? Yeah, you know, I think Twitter isn't as big as in, in Montana as other areas. We're a little late to the game, but that, that's an avenue that we're, we're working on. Um, we're, 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 we experimented with some stuff in our spring game through the cell phone again where they could text a code number and they'd get a discount if they come down after the spring game. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not real social media, but you're in a social setting up there. You get it, they see it. We don't really do an advertising. We link it through the telephone and bring the customer in that way. We do a lot of stuff with texting now mm -hmm. that we had never done before. Excellent. So it's, it's amazing, right, the big change being that we used to search the internet through our computers. 
Now it's all through our phones or our handheld devices. And it's, it's great that you're out there cutting edge trying to say, hey, how can we increase our customer experience? Because I know you're a big customer yeah. experience guy. You know, we don't have the cheapest drink in town. We don't have the most expensive, but our belief is you need to put in an atmosphere that people are willing to pay for a drink. There's a saying goes, it's easy to get the money into the till. It's hard to keep it in the till. So by providing that atmosphere, you can put more money into the till and you create that social experience. That's why social media is so important for what we, we try to accomplish here. So now, earlier you broke down, you basically have three time frames for diff three different sets of customers. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to figure that out and then to go meet their needs? Because they each have different needs, right? Yeah, and we have to be very cognizant of that too. Um, you know, we used to look at it as one year we were up 4% and I was looking at it, yeah, it's a pretty good year and I started really dying, diving into it. And, the system had the ability to look at it by the hours, but I wasn't using it to, to its need. And then I started doing some analysis and I go, you know what, our day part's up about 15%. Our late night was down about 2%. I said, I said we gotta figure out what's going on here. So now every week we have managers meetings, we talk about those three day parts. And the beauty of what we do and tie in, your first experience is typically from a college student. You come here, go to college you have a great time in the late night environment and then you move on into your career and that's when you become maybe that happy hour or, or lunchtime customer um, but so it's it's always a constant tie we get you when you come but then we build on that foundation as you grow older so we don't lose you we're, we're trying to stay in touch with you because of the experience you had and the memories mm -hmm. but yet we don't want to become your father's bar either because that's not where the young kid wants to be right mm -hmm. so we got to create and change i mentioned about the light show we do and stuff like that that's all stuff that we've added since we rebuilt so now you mentioned this weekly management meeting how long ago did you start what kind of changes did you see in your business because of doing it I've had management meetings since the day I've been in business and uh, I ran a beer distributor in California and we were owned by, they had three wholesalers in that and once a month uh, the president of the corporation would come and we'd spend a full day going from top to bottom going through that operation. As an employee at that time and as a manager, I dreaded it, I hated it. I used to lay awake at night worrying about it. Um, but as I went through life and I got into business myself, that was the success why we were successful. Because that president knew what was going on. He listened to what we said to how we need to make adjustments. So I've implemented that from day to one. And that, that's part of the communication process. One of the problems you have a breakdown in small businesses, you're so busy trying to get the doors open and uh, get the tails ready to go and everything like that, you forget to communicate with your help. So that one day a week now, we meet for about four hours uh, every Tuesday and talk about what happened the last week, what's going on in the next week, and what's going on two months ahead of time and, and try, try to plan. So that was part that it was developed through my experience in the beer business. And it, I, I look back, matter of fact, I tried to reach out to that guy that was my first boss. I didn't think he was very fair to me. Now I really appreciate what he did for me. How, how, what do you mean he wasn't fair to you? And, and what, did, what was a big lesson you learned from it? I, I thought that his requests were unfair and I was doing a great job. <laughs> and uh, he questioned everything I did all the time. And it, it was hard to grasp as a person, but I look back on it and that's who I am today because I question everything we do. It's never good enough. He did pat me on the back, but he was just really tough and his expectations were set high. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet him mm -hmm. and that comes back from the work ethic. My dad said, never let anybody get in your way. You yeah. just gotta work through it. <laughs> and, and now I thought he was in my way, but in the reality, he was making me better mm -hmm. and set me up for success. I see that every business has a life cycle. I think they teach the wrong thing. The only reason you have a life cycle is because you allow a life cycle to happen. A disruptor is like the brewery industry in the micro beers and things like that. You have a lot of people going, whoa, is me, blah, blah, blah. Well, the consumers wants that environment that they created. 
So we have to figure out how to compete in that, if we want to continue that happy hour business, how do we compete with that microbrewer and figure out what the consumer wants? If you figure out what the consumer wants, but why you have a life cycle is because the owner gets tired and they don't want to compete anymore. So when, when you decide you get tired and you don't want to compete, you ought to get out of the business because you're going to destroy your business. That's what's going to happen. You allow life cycles to happen. But I do, I, what I really do is try to talk to successful people that I've known that not necessarily in my industry. Um, I've got four or five really close mentors that I talk to. And then I constantly reach out to President Miller Brewing Company. I reached out to him the other day to talk to him. He, he's the guy that hired me in the brewery, but I've always kept that. I haven't worked for the brewery for 20 years, but he's very successful. There's something to learn from him and how he does what he does, why he got there. And hopefully he learns from me at the, at the, at the same time. Um, I've always, I, just, I, I, I reach out to people quite a bit and try to see how they're doing things. What kind of books do you like to read? I, I, I like to read autobiographies on people that have been successful. Um, Jack Welch that ran GE is somebody that um, I've done a lot of reading on. Um, so I like, um, like Donald Rumsfeld, his autobiography is very interesting and his ability and his strategic thinking and how he thought. So you get in that person's mindset when you're reading a book like that. Um, successful politicians they're successful politicians. And they're, they're all, the thing they all have in common is they're leaders, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you develop those leadership traits? And, and you never quit developing those traits. And that, that's a key conduit that you learn from all those people and their ability to adapt. You might think they're rigid people, the people I met, but if you look at how they operate today versus how they operated 30 years ago, it's different. So in looking at yourself introspectively, what are some of the changes you've made in your industry over the last, say, 20, 30 years where you said, boy, I was here and I saw that was a sticking point, so I had to evolve to keep my business going, keep myself going? You know, I think uh, probably a weakness that I have as a person is my temper. If you use it right, it can, but, but I've really gotten better at how I use it and how we manage the employees. And I've realized that I've got to let a manager manage and they might do it, not do it my way, but if we get to the end result, that's what matters. And that's what I've gotten a better at, is understanding getting to the end result. Um, it doesn't have to be the way I would get to the end result. And matter of fact, we might get quicker to the end result by doing it a different way. But you, know, you gotta create that fostering to allow people to do that too. That's just fantastic. Um, Wow, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, Mike. Any last parting words of wisdom you'd give to you know small businesses out there? Yeah, I think in the state of Montana, if you want to be successful, you should be a cat fan, number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shot at the moderator here. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? The, the key to success in business is the ability and willingness to go to work and don't give up. If, if you're willing to go to work and you, you don't give up, we have a great country and you can be successful and failures won't prevent you from being successful. Fail early, fail forward, fa or yeah. fail early, fail often, fail forward. And the fear of failure should drive you, okay? Yeah. That's what drives me to this day. I'm 55 years old, I'm still afraid of failure. You're <laughs> but, it, but I still fail. Absolutely. But it drives me. Every day we, we fail, right? Yeah, yeah. Mike, thank you so much, fantastic. Uh, again, Joel Silverman here with Mike Hope and the Rock and R Bar. Really appreciate your time today spending it with us. We know you're a busy man, so we'll let you get back to it because you got some great projects that I know you're going to be excited to announce when that time comes. But uh, boy, just what an honor, other than I'm in Bobcat land. But I, <laughs> I survived, folks, so we'll catch you on the go round. Thanks for spending time with us. <laughs> I had to get that shot in, Joel. Dirty Grizz had to get the last that shot in. <laughs>